Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Warm welcome to the marketplace. Coming up in this edition, oil marketing companies increase prices of petroleum products at the pumps with diesel and petrol selling at 12 cities 45 pesos per liter. Also in this bulletin, World Bank warns Ghana of risks of financial challenges and the tendency of losing its foreign direct investment inflows to other countries if this does not implement a critical action to address its current energy challenges. In the last few years, Ghana entered into some PPAs that were the wrong types, yeah. in our view, and at the wrong rates, at the wrong prices, and today you are paying dearly for it. And also it has an impact because today we're talking of green, green clean energy. Yeah. Plus, Fitch Solutions reaffirms position that economic activities in Ghana will get worse before getting better this year, despite economy growing appreciably in quarter one. Investment... Um recorded a pretty significant contraction, implying that domestic uh, conditions remain weak and that uh, growth will likely soften um, in the quarters ahead. We've got details of these and many others coming your way all in a moment. Please stay. Thanks so much for your company. I am Pius Kujubaka. Let's now look at our stories and some oil marketing companies have increased prices of petroleum products at the pumps beginning from today. However, the reasons for the increase have been mixed. While some are linking to the cost of price of bulk oil distribution companies, others are attributing it to the slight depreciation of the CD to the dollar. My colleague George Yafe has the rest of the story. Total Energies is selling a liter of diesel and petrol at 12 Ghana cities, 45 pesos, from its old price of 12 Ghana cities, 30 pesos per litre. Market leader Goyal is selling a litre of diesel at 12 Ghana cities, 45 pesos, while petrol is going for 12 Ghana cities, 40 pesos, from its old price of 12 Ghana cities, 30 pesos. Now, 12 Ghana cities, 45 pesos, that's the price that Shell is selling a litre of diesel at the pumps. However, petrol is going for 12 Ghana cities, 40 pesos. This should mean that prices have gone up by 10 to 15 pesos per litre in terms of increase in prices of petroleum products from this morning. However, reasons have been mixed. Whilst some of the oil marketing firms are linking the adjustment to an increase in the cost price of products sold by the bulk oil distribution firms, some of the firms are linking the adjustment to the recent challenges with the Ghana city. However, officials of the National Petroleum Authority are disputing this, insisting that the Ghana city has been fairly stable since last month. The bulk oil distribution firms have been explaining to Joy Business why their cost price have gone up. They are attributing this to an increase in prices of finished petroleum products on the international market. It's not clear for now how this could impact on transport fares as well as the general price levels of goods and services in let's stay a while longer within the energy space because crude oil production from the jubilee oil field has finally surpassed over 100,000 barrels per day according to the oil exploration firm this was after its jubilee southeast project come on or came on stream now the update was captured in a release to investors from the oil exploration firm this morning Group Chief Executive of Talu Oil PLC, Rahul Diaz, said reaching this milestone will help turn around the fortunes of Talu, its partners, and of course, Ghana. Let's get on phone and speak to Benjamin Boachi, Executive Director of the Africa Center for Energy Policy, ESEP, for some perspective on this and, of course, the increase in prices of petroleum products. Good to know you are on, Benjamin Boachi, and thanks so much for joining us on the marketplace. First off, prices of petroleum products have gone up by as much as 15 pesos per litre. Was this expected or surprised? Hello? Benjamin, are you on? Yes, I cannot hear you. All right, so I'm asking you um, what do you make of the prices of petroleum products going up by as much as 15 pesos per liter? And I asked whether it was expected or you would say you are surprised. 
No, I think there's been some marginal adjustment. Mm. Um, even uh, the, the international price movement hasn't been that stable. Um, so, I mean, for the market, you would expect that once it goes up, they would pass through, and also depending on who is giving you dollar uh, to import uh, the product, you would have to pass on, uh, you know, the, the exchange differential at the pump. So, those are the dynamics that really plays out when prices have to uh, go up or down. Um, I don't know what would be the situation for uh, the government side of things where they we are told consistently that they are trading gold uh, for oil. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that is where some answers will have to come from. Why would those buying gold for oil also be experiencing a movement uh, in price at this point? So those dynamics will have to be explained by those who are managing that part of mm-hmm. the value chain. Well, Ben, engaging some of the bulk oil distributing firms and, of course, oil marketing companies, the increase was not as a result of the CD's depreciation, but rather uh, prices going up marginally on the world market. Should we be worried, really? No, I think it's, it's not a sharp uh, stage. Uh, it's a marginal stage. We're hoping that it stays um, at that level. If it goes up higher, above the 78, 80 that we're seeing now, that would also mean that they have to pass on uh, whatever the, the price adjustment would be required. So um, at this point, we don't anticipate a huge uh, rise in price at this point, but um, you never know. That's the oil market uh, for you. Can government do anything about this? Uh, I mean, uh, the government can hardly intervene. Um, if we understood what the good for oil was are delivering, then we can look at how that intervenes. Uh, in this particular instance, uh, but if you check the price build up now, currently uh, you're looking at about 2.3 uh, CD. Even if they take all of that out, I mean, the strong prices will still uh, be as high as uh, above 10. So um, there's little room for government to intervene at this point. Mm. Ben, for, for the consumer trying to make sense out of this, um, should the consumer be worried going to the pumps to have a stand field? Um, the consumer has to always pay for uh, the price, uh, the market price. Um, you know, once it goes up, you have to uh, uh, pay what the market is dictating. Um, and when it comes down also, I mean, that is the fuel of the world. And uh, consumers always have to be aware uh, that the movement has to be absorbed by uh, the consumer. So um, I think it's just the usual preparedness to, to, to recognize that international oil prices are not stable. It goes up uh, and down. And when it goes up, you have to prepare to pay more, just as when it comes down. The only time you expect such huge intervention will be when uh, it's so significant that you know, it, it, it throws the entire economy of balance. Then you expect some policy action to really uh, offset any economic difficulty. But at this point, I don't think it's a major concern uh, for us in the industry and also for the government. Mm. Let's now talk something about the upstream sector and, of course, Jubilee Field. Should we be excited about this development in the last year over 100,000 barrels of oil production per day? Good news? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's good news for Ghana because it, it brings us back to the 2019 production level. Um, you know, Ghana has declined in oil production. We lost about 20 million barrels uh, a year since 2019. And therefore, having additional flows uh, from Jubilee then brings us back to around 170, 175 uh, thousand barrels of oil a day, uh, which should be good. I mean, particularly in this hard economic time where government revenues are constrained and we're looking for uh, uh, you know, additional sources of revenue. That could be a game changer uh, for the economic situation that we're in. So, uh, to that extent, it's, it's good news. But again, these are early days. We'll have to also look at what has gone into bringing up, uh, you know, extra 30,000 barrels of oil. We thought mm-hmm. about $4 billion have already been spent. Uh, we need to carefully look at what that means for cash flow for Ghana. Uh, you know, if they have to offset that kind of investment, then how much are we looking for on a year, uh, year-on-year basis? Those are dynamics that we'll, we'll have to look into in the coming days. 
Uh, talking about the dynamics, can we attribute this to a change in government's policy stance towards the sector? Can we? I mean, the Jubilee uh, uh, phase two, if you want to put it that way, uh, it, it's been on hold for some time. I mean, they should have completed that phase, uh, I think, 2016, 17, thereabouts. So it's actually delayed in commercializing the entire field uh, and doing that development. So it's been on, 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 on the drawing board. Uh, I mean, there are other fields that could have come uh, at this point to make us much richer and better, uh, which we have failed to actually deliver on. And a typical one will be the, uh, 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 the deep water uh, tunnel, which just got approval uh, for uh, development. Uh, you know, and other fields like the block four, which should have been fast tracked uh, to also bring on additional oil production. Uh, those didn't see any policy actions that could quickly bring that uh, on stream. Uh, so, yes, this is good news, but there are other actions, policy actions that are required to ramp up oil production, uh, perhaps to create that cushion that we need uh, at this critical moment. Mm. Mr. Boache, how do we sustain, or in your view, how do you think we should maintain this momentum going forward? No, I think we have to deepen transparency. I mean, over the years, we've worked hard with government to ensure that the oil sector is as transparent as it can be to attract investment uh, into the space. I keep mm. saying that transparency has become, you know, the, 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 uh, you know a very hard-to-find commodity in Ghana, if you want to put it, mm. uh, where investors are not sure, you know, what to do. Um, we started a competitive tendering process in 2018, Three years we couldn't negotiate uh, with the, the winners of the bid, and we're told that has been cancelled. Uh, you know, so I mean, we passed a law to ensure that we can attract investment, and we are not utilizing the law the way we should, but rather doing road shows uh, across the world, spending so much money, and no investor is coming in. And yet, those who are here are rather not getting the support that they actually need uh, to be able to uh, ramp up. Uh, the, the, the industry. And those are difficulties that we have to really resolve, be much more open, transparent, put the cards on the table, let everybody see it, and those who are interested uh, uh, will come and support the development of the oil and gas industry. It's not really rosy for us mm. uh, at this point. Because you check, I mean, for the past, um, you know, four years, so we haven't really been able to bring up a new, exciting uh, uh, field. And that tells you that exploration has been very, very low. Uh, we are not exploiting our basin. And if you're not exploring, you're not drilling, uh, you can't make discoveries and therefore add more uh, to your production. So the industry has been stagnant. So it has implications for the value chain. The Ghanaians that we have invested in local content, building their capacity, mm. they are all stranded. They are not doing a job because if there's no drilling and you are a drilling engineer, what are you supposed to do? If you have a drilling services company and there's no drilling happening, you have no business as a local company. And that's what is happening to many of the local businesses that came into the oil sector thinking they could make money. And suddenly there is no activity and they are all stranded. All right. Thank you very much, Benjamin Boache, for your time. He is the Executive Secretary, uh, Executive Director of the African Center for Energy Policy, ESEP, speaking to us on the back of latest development in the upstream sector. Let's move on to some other stories. And the World Bank has warned Ghana that it faces risks of financial challenges and the tendency of losing its foreign direct, direct investment inflows to other countries if it does not implement a critical action plan to address its currency, um, current energy challenges. According to its managing director of, the, of operations, Anna Bejadi, the issues confronting metering, billing, and revenue collection within the sector should be proactively done without interruption. Addressing the media at a press conference, she said her outfit will provide technical support to government and other stakeholders to save the sector from going down. The World Bank country director Nett earlier remarks said that deficiencies in the energy sector is being characterized by the power purchasing agreement, which is gradually driving Ghana's debt up. Those contracts that you've signed, those PPAs, are just too expensive. Mm. Uh, you know, too expensive, and the kind of PPAs you sign is take or pay, which means Ghana is paying to the electricity that is not even being produced. Yeah. You have double capacity, yes, over time. 
you know, usage will improve, so you, your excess capacity will go down. But the fact is, in the last few years, Ghana entered into some PPAs that were the wrong types, yeah. in our view, and at the wrong rates, at the wrong prices, and today you are paying dearly for it. And also it has an impact because today we're talking of green, green clean energy. Yeah. Many companies want to come to Ghana to do uh, you know, solar and all. Yeah, government wants probably the best thing to do, but you're, you are still caught up with those that you have to pay because you are tied up in these contracts. So you will take new ones, you will pay them. Now, the bank's managing director of operations as part of its three-day working visit to Ghana to deliberate on ways to support Ghana's economy said an immediate action is needed to save the energy sector as well as businesses. Uh, during COVID, of course, was very important, but it's also very important as Ghana takes on some of these reforms. So, um, uh, some time ago, the tariff was increased quite significantly, the electricity tariff, and that can only be done when you have also an accompanying social protection system that takes care of some of the lower income households to be able to absorb the higher cost of electricity. And then the third area is the energy sector in and of itself. There's been over the last few years a deterioration in the performance of the energy sector, particularly in the financial performance. And here we're trying to help with metering, billing and collections so that the uh, revenue collected from the sector can uh, go uh, to where it needs to be covering costs so that the energy is not, energy supply is not interrupted. So that's a very big part of our dialogue right now. And it actually is linked to us also providing support to the budget because we very much would like to support the government's actions to improve the energy sector as part of our budget support uh, initiative with the, with the authorities. She maintained that there's a need for more investment for renewable energy. Yeah, we talked about is actually starting to shift from conventional energy to renewable energy. We see huge potential in solar energy, for example. And around the world, what we have seen is when countries shift to renewable energy, you do need to make the commensurate investments also then in transmission equipment because it requires investments to be able to accommodate renewable energy technology. But what we see is that you all of a sudden get a, a very big new business line in services for renewable energy, which stimulates growth. You can even think about developing what we call local manufacturing capacity so that you get certain new areas of growth. So we see a lot of opportunities with the green economy and I think a lot of opportunity to think about the energy strategy also going towards green and interconnected to be able to export to other countries that need energy through the West African power pool and other interconnections. Ghana has huge potential in this field. Also, country director for the World Bank, Pierre Lapore, reiterated the bank's commitment to supporting Ghana's economic reforms. In terms of what's in the pipeline, uh, as you know, we are working uh, on a budget support operation for 300 million that we'll, we accept, expect to be approved before the end of the year to support the economic reform program. We also have a financial sector support operation of $250 million, also expected before the end of the fiscal year. As you know, with the domestic debt restructuring, this impacted on the capital adequacy of banks, and we are coming in also to support that as part of the border reform. And then we have several projects uh, like this in, in the pipeline in terms of investment. We have a youth entrepreneur youth employment program being, being in the last phase of preparation. According to the World Bank, growth is expected to slow further to 1.6% and remain muted in 2024 before returning towards its potential. James Sishen with us report. Now, Fitch Solutions has reaffirmed its position that economic activities in Ghana will get worse before getting better this year. This is coming despite the expansion of the economy by 4.2% year on year in the first quarter of the year. According to the UK-based firm, the relatively appreciable growth rate in the first three months of this year was primarily driven by strong government consumption as tax revenue shot up significantly. Fitch Solutions had projected that the country's budget deficit would narrow substantially to 5.7% in relation to the size of the economy in 2023 from an estimated 8.3% in 2022. Here is Mike Koroninga, senior country analyst for Sub-Saharan Africa, speaking on the media review of Sub-Saharan Africa. Acceleration in the first quarter of, of, of 2023 was primarily driven by strong government consumption and a widening trade surplus as, 
exports remained pretty solid while imports faltered. That said, household consumption essentially recorded uh, no growth at all, and fixed investment um, recorded a pretty significant contraction, implying that domestic uh, conditions remain weak and that uh, growth will likely soften um, in the quarters ahead. We project real GDP growth to average 3% this year, remaining well below Ghana's uh, pre-pandemic average of 5.3%, which is indicated by the uh, pink line here. So naturally, the next question is, why is this the case? So why will Ghana's economy operates uh, below capacity in 2023. And one of the key reasons here um, is weaker access to credit. To the treasuries market now, and government achieved about 19.5% of its treasury bills sale target. However, the cost of borrowing the domestic instrument went up um, for the 15th consecutive week. This, there is more in the following reports. The auction was oversubscribed due to the relatively smaller targets. According to the results published by the Bank of Ghana, the government got a little about 2.12 billion CDs from the sale of short-term instruments. The target for the auction was estimated at 1.77 billion CDs. A chunk of the bids came from the 91-day T-bill, where a little above 1.81 billion CDs were mobilized. The government, however, accepted all the bids tendered. Again, the government accepted all the 313.59 million CDs tendered for the 182-day bill. Meanwhile, interest rates continued to surge as the three-month bill increased by 0.29% to 24.3%. 39%. Also, the rate on the 182-day bill shot up to 26.40% from the previous 26.02%. Analysts are concerned about the rising interest costs as it may affect the government's quest to cut domestic interest payments. All right, so let's get more from Head of Trading at Republic Securities Ghana Limited, Adam Agama, for more. Adam, good to have you on, on the marketplace. What could be accounting for the 19.5% of T-bill sale target achieved? Well, good um, afternoon to you. Uh, well, what we are seeing is that because the demand is mounting, mm -hmm. investors are also taking advantage of that. We also saw the inflation rising last week, so investors also uh, um, placed that into consideration when bidding. Mm. And what's your analysis of the outcome and, of course, your expectations for this week? Well, uh, we expect the trend to continue because for this week, we are expecting the government to target 2.6 billion issuance in terms of 91, 182 and 364 day bill. Uh, the maturing securities for next week is 2.5 billion. So we expect interest rate to continue that same trend, uh, that same trend of increasing. Mm. Let's quickly go to the stock market and what are we to expect at the beginning of the week? Yeah, it's a bit slow this morning, but it's very natural for this market uh, on Mondays. We expect the week to pick up trading in some of the stocks like uh, MTN and Carl Bank. We, uh, the banking stocks are still having high demand for some like Carl, Stanchart, but stocks like uh, Ecobank Ghana, and Access Bank are still seeing high levels of supply on the market. We are grateful, Edem Magaba, for your time here on the market. Uh, please, uh, giving us the very latest from the treasury world. Now, a former board member of credit ratings agency Moody's, Professor Darrell Dufi, has cast doubts about the African Union establishing a rating agency. In March 2019, the AU Ministers of Finance and Economy officially adopted a declaration that such an institution was needed. In recent times, President Ekufuado has also attacked the rating agencies over their continuous downgrade of Ghana and other African economies. The African continent is said to be losing $75 billion each year due to credit rating bias. However, reacting to these claims, the renowned Professor of Finance, Darrell Dufi, who serves as a senior fellow at the Hoover Institute, said he disagrees there is a systemic, um, systemic bias by rating agencies. He's been speaking to Joy News' Blaise Suga at a roundtable discussion at Stanford University in San Francisco. That's true, uh, but that's somewhat different than the problem of which currency should we use for payments. 
Now, as long as you have sufficient dollars with which to make the payments, it's the it's the easiest and and usually the most stable uh, currency in which to make international payments. And very finally, ratings agencies are being criticized by the United Nations Development Program of skewing their reports against African or emerging economies. Do you share that concern as well? I don't share that concern, although I must say that I was on the board of directors of Moody's Corporation for 10 years. That was cited in the report. Yeah, it? so I, you know, my, uh, and, and, you know, that might suggest that I have a bias, but in fact it also informs me that they don't do that sort of thing. But how do you explain that to those who share their side of the story? That Well, it's mostly a narrative is cyclical about African economy. One of the things that I learned about rating agencies is that no one ever complains if you increase their rating to a higher level. But everyone complains if you lower their rating, and everyone suggests that that was unjustified. So, and there are many reasons given for why it's unjustified. In the end, the ratings agencies tend to get it right on average, and of course they make mistakes. But I don't see any uh, any uh, uh, systematic bias, and I don't see any anything like uh, a plan to uh, undercut. Uh, the advantages of certain countries by giving them a lower if rating. To publish a, t a, a clear um, roadmap or benchmarks that you use for your ratings, would that be far fetched? That's something that you could publicly put out? No, they, in fact, uh, their rating agencies do that. They provide research that goes with their ratings, pretty extensive research reports that explain the economic basis for the ratings. And it's not based on anything other than. Is the, is the debt issued by that country likely to be paid or not? It's not based on political concerns. It's not based on favoritism. It's simply trying to get it right. And they have a reason to try to get it right, because if, the rate, if a particular rating agency makes a mistake, then investors say, oh, we won't pay any attention to those ratings anymore. We'll go to the... This has been the marketplace with me, Pius Kojo Baka. Before we go, we do know that tomorrow it's a big day for Joy Business and, of course, the entire Joy News team. Economic transformation. Um, what should the policy declaration be in the 2023 media budget uh, review? We've got great panelists lined up for you. If you just want to stay with the channel, um, we've got these and many more all in the moment. But I am Pius Kojo Baka. Do visit our website, myjoyonline.com forward slash business. Grateful serving you. Do enjoy the rest of our programs. Bye.